In this unit, we're going to study second order differential equations. And we're only going to scratch the surface here, so we'll leave a lot of more complicated stuff off the table for the moment. If you remember, when we looked at applications of differential equations, one of the applications we looked at was the study of vibrations. And a simple case is what we call a mass spring damper system, where we have something like this shock that's pictured here, and we developed a second order differential equation that would model the movement of something connected to a spring system like this. And the equation we came up with looked like this here, where M stands for the mass, C stands for the damping constant, and K stands for the stiffness constant of the spring. F of T can be some external force, a forcing function. This is an example of a second order differential equation because there's a second derivative in the problem. In general, we can see second order linear differential equations look like this one, and there are more complicated second order equations, but second order linear ones look like this, kind of similar to what we saw with a first order linear differential equation, the same kind of structure to it, where we have a function that kind of serves as a coefficient for the second derivative of y, and then another one with y prime and another one with y equals some other function of t. Here we're using t as our independent variable, and y would be a function of t. So that's a general second order linear differential equation, but we're actually gonna make things even simpler because we're going to restrict ourselves to the case where a, b, and c are simply constant values. If they're not constants, the problem gets much more complicated, but if they are simply constants, the problem is relatively straightforward, as you'll see in a minute. And also, we're going to assume that that forcing function equals zero, that there's no external force on the system. So this would be something like this example here, where there's no external force, we simply move this mass and then let go and let the spring and damper take over and let it vibrate to rest. So we're taking some simplifying assumptions here, but it turns out that even with those simplifying assumptions, there are plenty of realistic cases where uh, examples fit this mold. So we're not restricting ourselves to useless equations. These are still useful, but if we tried to deal with non-constant coefficients or with a non-zero forcing function, things get a little bit more complicated. And if you go on to take a full differential equations course, you might see a little bit of that there. So our equation, very simply, will look like a times y double prime plus b times y prime plus c times y equals zero. That's the general structure of the types of problems that we'll solve here. a, b, and c are all constant values, so really all that changes from one problem to the next is the values of a, b, and c. And those values will control what the solution looks like. This is what's called a homogeneous second order linear differential equation with constant coefficients. That's a mouthful, but the homogeneous part means that it equals zero, that that forcing function is zero. And then it's linear because it doesn't have anything more complicated than y double prime, y prime, and y, similar to a first order linear differential equation. And then of course it has constant coefficients. So that's the type of problem we'll solve. And all that will change from one example to the next is the values of a, b, and c. Now it turns out that solutions to this kind of equation fit a standard form. And we won't prove this in any way. This is something we'll just take for granted and use it as we find solutions. But it turns out that when we solve a second order differential equation, we actually get two solutions. So we're gonna get two answers for y and we'll label them y1 and y2. Both of these on their own are valid solutions to the full differential equation. Now since we have two solutions, it turns out that we're gonna write a 
full final solution as what's called a linear combination of those two individual solutions. And a linear combination is nothing more complicated than just a constant times each one and then add them together. So we multiply each of them by a constant and add them together. These C1 and C2 are just like the arbitrary constants we've run across before and given initial conditions we can solve for those just like we've done in the past. So we've actually seen answers like this early on and we solved for those constants already and we'll see that again here. So the key to remember is just that when we solve this type of second order equation we're going to get two solutions each of which on its own is a valid solution but we'll write a final answer as this linear combination of the two. Now there's one more piece to this y1 and y2, these two solutions, are going to be what are called linearly independent solutions. This is really only important in one case that we'll mention in another video, but it's a crucial distinction to make because when we need it, we need to remember uh, that it's an important part of the solution. So when we actually get to solving these equations, there's one case where we'll need to carefully pick linearly independent solutions. And you'll see what I mean later on. But for now, that term linearly independent simply means that one solution isn't a constant multiple of the other solution. Let me give you an example. If, for example, the two solutions were three times the sine of t and negative four times the sine of t, those would not be linearly independent because you could get from 3 sine of t to negative 4 sine of t by multiplying by negative 4 thirds. So that's a constant multiple. But if it was 3 sine of t and negative 4 cosine of t, those would be linearly independent. One isn't simply a constant multiple of the other. For example, 2x and 4x squared if we were using x as our independent variable, those would be linearly independent. Or for example, e to the 2t and e to the 3t. Those would also be linearly independent because one is not a constant multiple of the other. There are ways to test this. We're not going to talk about them because they get a little bit more complicated, but if you take a full differential equations course, you may learn about what's called the Ronskian, which is a way to test whether two functions are linearly independent or not. For now, we'll just remember this basic definition and that'll be plenty for us. So going forward, what we're going to do is find for different values of A, B, and C, what are the solutions Y1 and Y2? And once we do, then our full solution just looks like this answer here. So our goal now is to figure out, given different values of A, B, and C, different coefficients, how can we find those solutions, Y1 and Y2, while remembering that they have to be linearly independent.